to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ it has been rightly stated that if you miss Jesus in the Old Testament, you've missed the ultimate purpose of the Old Testament. We welcome you today to our study of More About Jesus. Today we're going to be thinking about Christ in the Old Testament and in this series of lessons, we're going to be thinking about who was Jesus, what was his life like, and how does that affect the way we live. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together today. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly if you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about worship or the plan of salvation or, or what the church is, you'll find people in the Lord's Church at the Church of Christ in your area who'd love to sit down, open up God's Word with you, and discuss the Scriptures. And so check out the Church of Christ in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ... We'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you've got a question, you'd like to know more about uh, some of our lessons or more information from us, please contact us and let us know. Also, check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. All of our video, audio lessons, written transcripts, study questions, we've got a, a wide variety of good Bible study material available there, and it's all free of charge to you anytime. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form, and we'll be glad to send that to you free of charge as well. And so if you need a, if you need a digital download, that's available as well. Just go to the media request form and indicate that there as well. Today we're thinking about one of the really powerful and, and unique studies in the life of Christ, and that is Jesus in the Old Testament, as we began with, someone has rightly said, if you miss Jesus in the Old Testament, you've pretty much missed the ultimate purpose of the Old Testament, starting in the Garden of Eden and working its way through the patriarchs and the prophets and the kings of Israel. The, the ultimate message is the Messiah Christ is coming. And of course, in the New Testament, we're introduced to Jesus, not as a promise or a prophecy, but rather as a reality. And so today we're going to think about some images, some pictures, some, some impressions of Jesus in the Old Testament that both remind us of His power and His majesty, but also make personal application to our lives today as well. And so we begin by thinking about the majesty and power of Christ at creation. Now, thinking about Christ at creation may seem a little unusual at first, for when we open our Bible to Genesis 1 verse 1, we hear these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as we watch chapter 1 unfold, we see God's handiwork in the creation of the world, the universe, creation of all the animals and plants and man and, and everything there is. And, and usually when we think about God at creation, we think about the power and handiwork of the Father. But listen to the words of Genesis 1 verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image. God used a personal plural pronoun to describe himself. Who is this us? Well, we know there's the Father, 
We have mention of the Holy Spirit as God, and He hovered on the face of the deep in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, but also Christ was active at creation. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18. God made all things through Him. Through Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 4. He was the creation, the agent of creation in Hebrews 1 verse 4. And then listen to John 1 verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Jesus was God's agent of creation. God used him in the creation of the world. And, and by that, we can see his, his majesty and his power. Just think about it. God spoke and everything came into existence. That was Christ. God took and created the world out of nothing. And his infinite power and wisdom and, and intellect are shown in that. That was Christ at creation. And friend, if, if Christ could do that at creation, if out of nothing He could speak and the world came into existence, imagine what He can do in our lives with His majesty and His power if we'll just let Him. You know, Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I let Christ rule and reign in my life, the things He's able to do, the things we're able to do through Him, friend, we can't even begin to imagine with God's help. And so initially we think about the majesty and the power of Christ at creation. Then I want you to consider this image of Christ in the Old Testament, and it's this. The prophets and the patriarchs were promised that through the Messiah, through the seed of Abraham, God would bless all nations. Well, who is that seed? Let's open our Bible to Genesis chapter 12, and I want you to look at a couple of passages where this promise is given to the patriarchs. Look at the promise made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and I want you to notice what the writer here says. Genesis chapter 12 Look in your Bible, beginning in verse number 1. The Scripture records this for us. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now notice verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, initially, Abraham probably took that to mean that his lineage would be blessed because he would be the patriarch of that. But you've got to see the bigger picture here. It wasn't just to Abraham. This promise is also made to Isaac. And ultimately, the New Testament is going to teach us this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Look in Genesis chapter 22. Notice this promise detailed even more clearly to Isaac. Genesis 22. Look at verse number 18. These words are said, In your seed, to Isaac the promise is made, In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Did you hear those words there? God said to Isaac and, and to Abraham, In your seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. And again, they've got to be thinking naturally, their lineage, their children, those who would come from uh, their loins, those would be the ones who would, who would bless the earth. But again, you've got to see the big picture under the interpretation of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The promise to Abraham, the promise to Isaac, the promise to David in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 that his seed, all of that ultimately and finally is fulfilled in Jesus. How do we know that? Let's get the rest of the story in Galatians chapter 3. Open your Bible to Galatians 3 and I want you to see what the Holy Spirit tells us in Galatians 3 beginning in verse number 15. Paul says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, 
Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now watch this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. And here it is. And to your seed, who is Christ. The writer says, when God made that promise to Abraham, when he made it to Isaac, he did not say, Abraham, I'm going to bless all nations through your seeds. Isaac, I'm going to bless all nations through your seeds. He said, no, to singular seed. And here is that seed. And to your seed. And he interprets it, who is Christ. Friend, the ultimate one who would bless all nations, not the Hebrew nation alone, who would bless all nations is Jesus Christ. Genesis 3 verse 15, the Bible says the seed of woman would crush the head of Satan. Romans 16 verse 26, Paul says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Who is that seed of woman? The New Testament again affirms that Christ and Christians are the only ones. Christ is the only one who has the power to deal that death blow to Satan. And so friend, in a world where there's so much chaos, in a world where it looks like it's turned upside down, there is inhumanity against man, there's ungodliness, there's immorality, how, how, is, how are people going to be blessed today? The only way we can find God's blessing upon people is through Jesus Christ. He's the only hope that our world still has even 2,000 years later. Then as we turn our attention further to the Old Testament, we now hear this promise and prophecy about a peace bringer or a peaceful one who is to come. Look in your Old Testament in Genesis chapter 49, and I want you to see the promise that is here made through the patriarch to the 12 tribes of Israel and specifically to the tribe of Judah here. Genesis 49 verse 10 Jacob is blessing his sons, and in the blessing to Judah, it is said in verse number 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, listen to this, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This word Shiloh. What does that mean? Some versions will translate that until the peaceful one comes. The scepter would be the kingly staff, the lawgiver, the one who presents God's law, and the peace bringer or peace giver is Jesus Christ. And so here we have Jesus, the Messiah of the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7, 14, as the one who was ultimately going to bring peace. Again, when you think about all the problems in our world, when you think about all the fighting, when you think about all the anger and all the hatred and all the, the angst that man has against his own, uh, against man, how are we going to find peace? Luke 2 verse 15, when Jesus came into the world, the angels said, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Jesus brought peace by His cross. Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15. You see, Jesus is the one who brings peace because ultimately He brings God and man back together. Man was separated from God because of sin. Romans 3 verse 23. And yet Jesus bridged that gap by His sacrifice. Hebrews 9 verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And yet Jesus shed His own blood so that we could be brought back together to be in a peaceful relationship with God. And thus He made peace with God by the gospel of peace. And friend, that's what helps us to be at peace as well. And so if we want a world that has hope, that has peace, that ultimately brings God the glory, You've got to see Jesus as the one who brings peace both in the Old and the New Testament today. Then we're going to see a very clear picture 
of Jesus in the Old Testament as the deliverer of his people. I want you to think about him as a type of Moses for just a moment. Moses in the book of Exodus. God's people are now in Egypt uh, because uh, as you remember the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob became great and Joseph became great in power in Egypt and he, he there has his people there. But now a new Pharaoh arises in Exodus 1 and God's people are in great servitude. And so God raises up Moses, a deliverer, and Moses, through the ten plagues, delivers God's people. They, they go through the Red Sea on, on dry land, and God brings that, uh, the waves down on the Egyptians, and, and God's people are set free from the bondage of slavery at the hand of Moses. And then in Hebrews chapter 3, we learn of one who is greater than Moses. Christ is greater than Moses in that Moses was a servant in God's house. Christ is son over his own house, whose house we are. Jesus is a, uh, compared to Moses and even in a greater sense in that although Moses delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage and from Pharaoh, Christ delivers his people today out of bondage to Satan and slavery to sin. And you can clearly see him as a type of deliverer of his people. You see, sin and Satan is what we're in bondage to today. Oh, Pharaoh was a harsh taskmaster, and the Egyptians were wreaking havoc on the people of God, and, and there was even death and mayhem caused by that. But friend, that doesn't begin to compare with the havoc that sin is wreaking on people today and Satan is wreaking on people today. Ultimately, people, because of Satan, are in bondage to sin and are going to be lost. Enslaved. Look at the things today that people are enslaved in. Drugs, sex, immorality, all types of hedonism today and bondage to sin and Satan because of that. Who can deliver men? Out of that today, Jesus is more than able to save those who come to him because he ever lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, verse 25 and 26. And so when you think about Moses and the great things he did as a deliverer of his people, friend, Jesus is far superior to Moses in every way because ultimately he can deliver us from a life of sin and bring us into a right relationship with God. Another beautiful image of Christ in the Old Testament is His sacrifice being that, that spotless sacrifice for sin. We don't have time to read every part of it today, but if you open to Leviticus, and especially in about chapters 1 through 9, you're going to see there that there were multiple sacrifices that were made for sin. You've got that, that, the, the bull, you've got the heifer, you've got the lamb, that, and all of those were picturesque. They had to be spotless. They had to be the choices of the flock without spot or blemish or defect. And if any man got involved, any person got involved in sin, they would go out to the field, they would bring that, that animal sacrifice in, and that animal would be sacrificed on the altar. Its blood would atone for sin. And even then, even under the Old Testament, even then, those pictures we see of the atonement for sin. Hebrews 10, 3 and 4 says they could never, the blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. All of that was predicated on the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. But picture in your moment, picture in, mind, in your mind for just a moment that lamb being offered for the sins of the people under the Old Testament, its blood being spilled on the altar. You know, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the one who causes God to accept. His sacrifice is what causes God to accept us as His people and atones for our sin. You know, there's so many parallels between Jesus and even in a greater sense that Him as that spotless Lamb of God. John 1 verse 29, when John saw Jesus approaching, he identified Him that way. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1 verse 29. Think about 
the parallel here. The lamb under the Old Testament had to be spotless and without defect. Hebrews 4.15 says this, Of Jesus, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Spotless or perfect. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22. Under the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins. And yet Hebrews 9.22 says the same is true today. And Jesus has made that once for all sacrifice for sin. And friend, this is what brings us hope. This is what brings us victory. Uh, there's a unique picture in Revelation 4 and 5. No one is there to open the book and to unleash the scrolls and uh, to bring God's message. And then it's as though all of a sudden, Here's the Lamb who was slain from eternity, from the foundation of the world. He's able to open the book and to release the scrolls and the message therein, and they no longer have to weep because of that. The, the clear picture there is Jesus' sacrifice, His atonement, brings God's message of hope to people today. And so we see Christ in the Old Testament, even in a greater sense today, as that spotless, perfect Lamb of God. When you think about Jesus in the Old Testament, there's another picture I want us to see. And this is such a, a graphic image of Christ as the suffering servant for us today. I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah 53 with me and, and notice this picture of Christ in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah chapter 53 and listen to the image that is drawn out here in this text. When you see glimpses of Christ in the Old Testament, this is such a clear one. Isaiah 53, we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. The Bible says, Surely, this is about the suffering servant, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Listen to this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And, and as you read more into Isaiah 53, you can clearly see the one whom God chose to suffer for mankind, this suffering servant of God who willingly was beaten, mocked, spit upon. I mean, you can't help but envision what's going on leading up to the events of the cross and on the cross as Jesus goes through unimaginable suffering for me and you. Now you say, okay, that's all good and well, but how does that apply to the New Testament? Listen to what Peter says of Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 24. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. And now He's going to quote Isaiah 53. By whose stripes we are healed. Friend, when I think of graphic pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament, this is pretty much near the top what he went through, how he was beaten. The writer of Isaiah 53 will say how his visage, how his appearance was marred, how he bore our sins, how God put our sins upon him. All of that is a clear picture of what Christ did for each one of us in the New Testament. And then, of course, in Psalm 22, you can see a picture of the scorned Savior. Look at Psalm 22 for just a moment. And again, these are images that are so graphic and so clear, found both in the Old Testament and fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. Psalm 22. I want you to look beginning in verse number 16. The psalmist said, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. Listen to this. They pierced my hands and my feet. They count, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among themselves and for my clothing. They cast lots. Friend, when you think about that, you, you can't help but see 
what Jesus went through on the cross. Imagine. Uh, the, the dogs surrounding me, the congregation of the wicked is there. They, they stare at me. They mock at me. Think about what Jesus went through up on the cross. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross, they said. They would mock Him. They would, they would spit on Him. They would, they would be in Him. All, all that Jesus endured on the cross. And then to hear the psalmist say, I can count all my bones. You know, Isaiah said, his visage was marred more than any man. His appearance was marred more than any man. Can you imagine what Jesus must have looked like on the cross? And then you can hear this echo in your mind. They divide my garments and for my cloak, they cast lots at the foot of the cross. In Matthew 27, that's exactly what the soldiers there did. They were gambling at the foot of the cross to see who would get Jesus' garment there. And so when I think about images of Christ in the Old Testament, I see His majesty and I see His power. That power is available in my life and yours today if we become children of God. I see Him as the promised seed who, and the only way who all men can be blessed by today. We see Him as the one who delivers His people from greater bondage than that of Pharaoh and, and servitude, delivers us from the bondage of sin and Satan. We see Him as the great suffering servant who was scorned and mocked on the cross, but who did all that so that we could have the hope and the joy of heaven. And so it's been so rightly stated. If you don't see Jesus in the Old Testament, You've pretty much missed the ultimate purpose of the Old Testament. The message of the Old Testament is Christ is coming. The message of the New Testament is Christ has come and He's coming again and you can go and be with Him if you're faithful to God and become a Christian. And so today, my friend, we ask you, are you a member of the Lord's church, the church that Jesus established and died for? Have you been washed in the blood of that sacrificial lamb as we see in the New Testament? If you've never done that, why not do that today? Do you believe in Jesus as God's Son, John 8, 24? Would you turn from a life of sin in repentance to God, Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5? Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, and to have every sin washed away? Would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? We're so glad that you joined us for our study today. And please join us next time as we think more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the